Welcome back, everyone. Kevin Carpenter with C++ Events and talking with Barry Rebson. Did I get the last name right, Barry? That's right, yeah. Uh, we're getting ready for CppCon, and this year is going to probably be the year of reflection, which is why I'm super stoked to have Barry here because you get to go see him on Monday at 2 p.m. for practical reflection. And and I just happen to know, and I'll, I'll get to it later, but there's a few other things. That there's definitely, I think, three or four talks that are reflection, especially with it hitting the standard this year, right? Or at least passing committee. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a big year. It just got adopted at the last meeting in Sofia. Um, so I think everyone's pretty excited about it. So uh, Barry is a senior C++ developer at Jump Trading in Chicago. Um, unreasonably, I like that. Unreasonably active on Stack Overflow. <laughs> That's, you know, I used to live on Stack Overflow, but I'm curious what's going to happen with AI now. I just have to say, you know, the the questions yeah. will be answered equally wrong, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 kind of interesting. It's going to be, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to that site long term um, with with how good the tools have been becoming at answering questions pretty well. Um, but, you know, where where are they going to get the new information from? Like, I don't, I don't know. Exactly. It's going, going to be interesting to... To see, I certainly have no prediction. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm just watching, and you know, the, the sitting the the meme where you're sitting back with with popcorn, just kind of watching and waiting to see what happens. I, I kind of get that. So escalating your C plus plus by attending the standards committees um, starting in 2016. So what got you drawn? I mean, what drew, what drew you to that? No, it, it, it kind of felt like the logical next thing. Like I, I started being very active on Stack Overflow in like 2015, started answering a lot of questions. I, I learned a ton just by doing that because um, mm -hmm. it was like, I was like, I don't actually know the answer to this question, but I'm going to force myself to determine the answer to this question so that I can answer it. And I just did that over and over and over again. Um, and at some point, you know, I got a sense of like, you know, where are things in the standard, how to read the standard, how to find things. And then it's like, okay, well, like, well, what's the next thing after that? It was like, well, how do you, how do you make changes to things? It's like, what about you know things that I find annoying or maybe a little bit wrong? Um, and then I came across and it's like, oh well, like, you know, people actually work on this. This is this is a thing that people do. You know, you could you could just show up. Um, so I kind of just showed up one year. Um, kept coming ever since. <laughs> That's you know, I've I've had a few people they you know. With all the stuff I've done in conferences, it's like, oh, you should come to committee meetings. Um, but I'm just not like there are things that I like and dislike about the language. But when I think of some of the papers I've seen written by yourself or um, Hannah and just others, I I just don't have that detail level. But I appreciate the fact for everyone on the committee that does, you know, because the amount of work, you know, especially listening to like Teamer talk about um the way getting things pulled together at committee meetings, it's like, it's a lot of work. And so, you know, from the rest of us that just end up using the language, thank you for all of that extra work you do because it is appreciated. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely a ton of time, but it's, it's a thing that like, it's, it's a skill just as much as anything else. Right. And like, mm -hmm. like anything else, like you just got to do it to get better. Um, like if you, if you read like the first papers I wrote, like they were not good. Um, I had no idea how to structure things. And I, I had no idea how to, how to make arguments. Um, but if you just do that relentlessly enough over time, um, you, you kind of eventually figure out like, oh, this is, this is like a good structure. This is how to frame arguments. This is what people find interesting or not interesting or compelling. Um, and yeah, just like over time, I've gotten better at it. That makes me think of my first full length talk I ever gave and how I wish it would just disappear into cyberspace forever, but compared to what I do now. So I understand what you mean, you know, from that perspective, that's for sure. So you're doing a reflection talk, but it sounds like your talk is going to focus on implementing structive arrays, you know, for an arbitrary aggregate. And so, you know, when I think of structive arrays, you know, it makes me think of like SIMD because of, you know, data and contiguous layout, um, you know, and cache performance. But give us a sense, you know, can you give me more of a sense of what you're going to look at with that? Yeah. So so one of the things I'm, I'm definitely not going to do is really like I'm not trying to like motivate structive arrays or talk about why it's interesting or good or the performance aspects of it. Like Vittorio is going to do that at his keynote. He's much more like suited to talking about this stuff than I am. 
Um, what I thought about it is that it's a very interesting problem from the perspective of like, okay, well, like, let's say you have a, you're in a situation where like, you think that this is a better data layout for you. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you restructure your data to have that layout? Well, like today, I mean, that's kind of a pain. Like, okay, I have my one vector and now I have to rewrite it. I probably have to like manually write multiple things or like figure out how to do that. Um, and I'm not even sure yet if this is a benefit, right? So like I have to do all this work, restructuring a lot of code, rewriting a lot of things just to find out if it's worthwhile. Um, and then I watched the Zig talk um, that Andrew Kelly gave when he was talking about like things that he was doing in the Zig compiler. Mm -hmm. And he, he was talking about structive arrays briefly. And he made a one line code change from like array list of T to multi array list of T. And it's like, okay, now I have structure arrays. And it's like, if it was that easy to do that in your code, you would just do it. And then, right. it's like, oh, did this help me? Yes, no, okay, it, it did, and now I'm, now I'm done. And one of the cool things about reflection is that like, oh, I can actually, I can actually do this. Like I can, I can implement the same thing. And so that like, you can make that one line code change to find out if it's interesting. And, and what I like about that example in particular is that I think working through that example touches on a lot of um, topics that are relevant and like, well, how do you do things with reflection? Yep. Um, and so like my, my broad goal is to try to touch on as many of those little topics as possible. I'm going to go on like a lot of little digressions about how to solve this sub problem and that sub, sub problem um, to kind of give people a sense of like, these are these are like, this is like a brand new toolkit, right? Like we're, right. we're kind of, we're, we're not even so much as inventing tools as we're inventing like the whole, the whole tool shed. Um, yeah. And so like, this is, this is the kind of thing that you might want to do to solve this kind of thing. This is the kind of tool that might be useful in this situation. And so give people a sense of like, this is what's out there right now. Um, right. We don't even know, we don't even know what's possible really. We're only just starting to scratch the surface. It's funny you say that because I, when I was getting ready to chat with you, I stole the line from an upcoming release from one of our other keynotes and, and everyone can guess who probably made it, but C++ 26 marks the most transformative turning point in our language's history. And so, you know, when I thought of serialization, of course, the first thing that always came to my mind, just because it was the only way I really used it before was automatic serialization, you know, being able to easily because I do a lot of JSON. I, I do credit card processing. And so from that end, you know, the things that I would see with serialization and other languages just, I mean, it's not that I had to have it, but it certainly would have made it easier in C++. But that's not even, but in the scheme of things, it seems to me like that's not even 10% of the, of the landscape of what's going to be able to change. Yeah, this is, this is what I think excites, excites us the most about things. It's like, you know, we've been we've been working through a lot of examples over the years. You know, we, we started with like, OK, well, these are the problems that we know that we want to solve. And if we can't solve them, then we then our design sucks and we need to iterate on the design until we can solve them. Um, and then we got that. And then we start discovering new things that we can do. And it really is just like discovering new things we can do. And some of these are, you know, uh, David thought that substitute would be an interesting function to add. And he doesn't even remember why he thought that it was an interesting function to add. And it turns out that this is sneakily one of the most useful functions in the entire library for like the breadth of things that we've figured out that you could do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when um, even on the on the flight back when we were, we were flying home from Sophia, Dan threw this example together of like, oh, well, now you can hash embed a JSON file. And down during reflection time, uh, parse that and produce a type with named members of the fields of your JSON, right? So like, I just have a random JSON file. It has like some string key and an int value. And now, uh, now I have a struct with like an int member named that thing populated with that value. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't know that we could do that and, and you can. So, you know, what is, and that's just like what we figured out so far. So now right. a compiler is going to implement this. You're going to have thousands of you know, smart and curious people banging against this. And like, who knows what, what people are going to come up with in the future. Um, it's it's going to be, it's going to be pretty exciting to, to find out, I think. It is kind of interesting because it just made me think about it. Like when, when we put out uh, a proposal or such and it gets approved, it, it's really just like the, the parameters or the blueprint, because then just like you said, as everybody starts banging on it at the compiler and adding it in, adding it in so that we can use it and then libraries end up getting built on top of it. It's that's also kind of scary though, right? Because it's always like you make an interface 
And it always gets used 20 ways that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. So, so do you think it's going to do a lot with, I mean, so meta programming, right? Type traits, the, that's always been more compiler based. Now we could be doing type traits without compiler intrinsics, correct? Yeah. And what, so one of the interesting things is it opens the door to, there are so many more things that you can implement as a library today. Um, things that you could only have implemented as a compiler extension yesterday. Yeah. Um, and so first that just like lets you do more things. Um, you know, I had this, one of the things that I was trying to pursue was extending um, the the kinds of class types that you can use as non-type template parameters, right? So in C++20, we added support for, for using class types, but only types that have all public bases and members recursively all the way down. Um, so that's useful, but it obviously excludes a lot of extremely useful types, right? You can't have string, you can't have vector, you can't have tuple. Um, and so it turns out that we're reflection, like I can implement as a library support for arbitrary types. I wrote a blog post about this recently. And so like, well, that's something that like, I mean, eventually I want that to become a compiler feature, right. but, but I can proof it as a library right now. Um, yeah. And there's so many other things that fit into that boat. It's like, okay, well, like this is, this is a lot easier to implement as a library with reflection than it is to implement as a compiler uh, extension. And as a library, more people can can use it, right? Uh, and and we've also seen that in other languages too. Like I know this is this has been big in uh, so in Rust, for instance. Like there's a lot of things you can do with procedural macros, like way more than than we can do with reflection. Like all sorts of like you can embed compilers in other languages into your Rust program. Like sure, oh, wow. Sure. Um, and but people can use that to like do an implementation of something that really kind of should be a language feature. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate that it's useful. Get a lot of a usage experience with it, and then, like at some point in the future, it becomes a language feature that's heavily motivated by like the existing practice of this of this uh, macro based library, um, and that that's also really exciting because like you know it's it's one thing to whenever we want to try to add new libraries into yep. the, into the standard, it's like okay, well, obviously you want people to have used them, you want there to be uh, usage experience with them because. Like, yeah. why would you standardize them otherwise? But that that's always very hard to do with language features, right? Because how are you going to get a lot of existing practice or like a usage experience with new things? If you need people to like download your compiler fork and build it and start like that, that's hard. But um, getting usage experience with a, with a library, that's, that's a ton easier. Um, yeah. so, so I think it paves the way for like a very different um, approach to even thinking about how we do language feature standardization. That's really cool. So to hit on something not C++ related, just because I see the swimmers there on the side yeah. and, and I saw that in your, in your note on your bio. Um, so a big swim fan, right? Oh yeah. So I have to ask, did you ever watch uh, Sebastian Theophil's lightning talk guide to C++ conferences for swimmers? No, I did. I did not. Okay. So if you get a chance, he did it at C++ now. It's it's just kind of funny because I can't remember who it was. It started off with someone doing a similar talk for runners. And so he goes through and lists the different, you know, bodies of water or pools near each conference and which you would prefer to swim in, you know, all the way from the coldest to the warmest. Nice. <laughs> so, well, listen, Barry, I don't want to take up too much more of your time today because I can just say like for everyone coming to the conference, Barry's talks on Monday, 2 p.m., he, he, we only get him for Monday and Tuesday. So your conference track with Barry is narrow. Uh, so make sure you track him down after his talk. And, and I really appreciate you giving me insight on reflection and, and I look forward to seeing you on Monday at the conference. Yeah. Come check it out. I think it'll be, I think it'll be a fun talk and hopefully useful and informative too. So if you don't have your tickets yet, of course you need to get your tickets to CPPCon. And again, Barry, thanks and have a great week. All right. Thanks. You too.